Well, praise the Lord. Good to see everyone this morning. And uh, seems like we're getting an early start. <laughs> so maybe we'll have an early start for lunch. Who knows? I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. Well, I believe, you know, one of the things we hate as human beings is to feel weak and unable. That's just a uh, human condition because we have pride. We suppose that we can do stuff and we need to. But I thank God that if we can understand the way things really are, we won't see that as a bad thing, but we'll see that as God's love and mercy that we reach out and, and depend upon Him. And I'm certainly doing that this morning, uh, but I just thank God for His promises. I thank Him. So many of the songs this morning were just confirmations of thoughts that I've had. And so let's just trust the Lord and look to Him this morning and ask Him to, to help us. You know, Paul wrote a couple of letters to the church in Corinth. We know them as the Corinthian letters. And uh, these were churches who had a lot of problems, didn't they? They had a lot of issues that, that Paul had to deal with. They would come out of heathen darkness, most of them. And uh, so whether it was, you know, sexual stuff, whether it was, you know, problems within, all kinds of problems within the church, you name it, they had to deal with it. And so Paul wrote these letters to them. But I don't think it's any... Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any surprise in how he begins the 1 Corinthians letter. Because the first thing he does, I'm just going to kind of go through this a little bit, just a, a little bit superficially until I get to the point that I want to get to. But Paul begins by reminding them that they are called, they've been set apart, they've been called by God, they've been given everything they need. You know, I think it's something we need to stop and remember. No matter where we're at on our journey, God has given us everything we need to serve Him. That's a good thing to remember. We feel like we're so unworthy and un unable, and, and all of those things are true. Those things are true, but that's not the whole story. And so before Paul dealt with this particulars, he wanted to lay down some real foundational truth, and God wants that foundation to be constantly in our hearts and our minds. What, where are we at if we don't have that? If we're just trying to deal with issues out here, we don't get the foundation, we're just struggling. And so Paul wanted them to know that. But one of the first issues that he, de he dealt with was the problem, the very human problem that they were a uh, the Corinthian believers were attracted to different speakers, different, work, different laborers. Some said, I'm a Paul, I'm a Apollos, I follow Jesus, I follow Peter, I, you know, very human kinds of things that we follow, you know, what we believe are, are leaders for the wrong reasons. And, and Paul says, that's not what it's about. And he comes down to the fact that, you know, was, was I crucified? With, was, was Peter crucified? Was I crucified for you? No, that's not, what, that's not the foundation that we're resting upon. It's not who does what. It's, it's, is it Christ doing it? Okay? And he says, I didn't baptize any of you. Well, I, he did baptize a couple, but that's not why he came. And so you come down to verse 15, I believe it is, or 17, isn't it? It says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Gospel means good news. It was a message. And even that, he says, not with wisdom or eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. That's pretty significant, isn't it? Because don't we as human beings value what he calls eloquence and wisdom? We would like to listen to somebody who's a good speaker. Man, they know how to put the words together. They know how to put, add the emotions and the gestures and, and everything. They are just, they can hold you spellbound because of their ability to speak. And others, it's, it's all about how much they know and how much they're, they're, the ability they have to communicate ideas with clarity and, and oh, how we value those things. But Paul says, that's worthless. All that does is empty 
God, the cross of Christ from its power. The power is where God is going with this. I could have all the information. I could be entertained by somebody who says all of the right things. Let that sink in. You could have somebody that explains it just right, that says all of the right words, but if there is no power present, it's worthless. You can convert people to your ideas. You can convert people to following a man who is gifted in many natural ways. But if the cross of Christ is emptied of its power, then all you're doing is making people religious. God, help us to never lose sight of where God is going with, all, with the message. It's not just about the information, is it? It's not about human ability. If it were, I'd resign right now. I don't, you know, I'm just who I am, and that's okay. You know, that's, a, that's another truth that we need to recognize. God made you like you are. You don't have to compete with somebody else. You don't have to impress somebody else. God wants us to be vessels through whom he can help one another. It has nothing to do with who you are and how strong you are and how smart you are. Of course, he does say that later in this chapter, doesn't he? But listen to what he says following. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to whom? To those who are perishing, the people of the world who don't get what this, what this is about. They may, people of the world may be impressed with somebody in their natural ability. But unless they connect with what God is trying to, trying to convey into a human heart, the power what good is it? It does no good whatsoever, okay? But to those who are perishing, this message uh, is foolishness. But to us who are, this is very interesting here, the way it translates this correctly in the NIV. But to us who are being saved. So here's salvation is not being treated as an event and then it's done. This is being treated as, yes, there is a starting point. Yes, there's a time when people pass from death to life. That, absolutely, just like a baby is born. They pass from the birth canal into the world. And good luck to them then. But there, just as there is a beginning point, but there's also a growth. We're not born as adults, are we? We're born as babies, and there needs to be a growth. So it's the same way with the gospel. It imparts real, genuine life to those who open their hearts to it. There's real power that, that is infused into our beings. But that's only the beginning. We are still in the process of being saved, being transformed, being brought to a place where we're living by God's life and not ours. So it is a process. I need more than information to help that process along. Okay, I need power, don't I? Okay? And so he goes on, Paul does, to talk about how God so totally bypasses man's ability to figure things out. I mean, he's talking in a context where it wasn't that long before you had all the famous Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and, uh, and, and others, and all how they devoted their lives to figuring out how the world works and what's the meaning of everything and how do we navigate this world and, and bring it to something that's meaningful. And so God says, I hid everything I was going to do from all of them. They don't have a clue. Okay. So it wasn't about the world's wisdom. And in fact, doesn't, doesn't he say in the next chapter, he hid his plan from the devil himself. I expect Satan is a little bit smarter than, was a little bit smarter than Plato. But the devil didn't know either. He was trying to work out his plan to become his own God and rule over this, rule over this race that God had created and he had successfully corrupted. Okay. But he didn't have any idea what God was doing, and God hid it from him. That's why people, a lot of people don't understand the Old Testament. All that was doing was setting in motion what God did through Jesus Christ. That was the heart of everything. Praise God. So he says, How, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world by through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Then he talks about two different kinds of unbelievers. And he says the, the Jews have one way of looking at things. They want a sign. 
You say you're from God, show us a sign. Well, what, what do they mean by a sign? A miracle of some kind, something you could see, something you could detect with your senses. Oh, yes, there's a sign. That must, be, must mean you're from God. You know, the reality is Jesus gave them all the signs they could ever have wanted. And most of them remained in unbelief. That does not conquer real unbelief. We need God to work in our heart. We need to get past all of these excuses that people have. I won't believe unless you show me, unless you prove it to me. And then, of course, you got the Greeks. Again, they were all about wisdom, weren't they? They just had it. i got to button that top button, don't I? Okay. All right. Praise God. Now we got it right. But the Greeks were all about wisdom, again. They had to figure it out. And so somebody of that mentality would say, you know, i got so many questions. God, I'll believe you, but you got to explain it all to me. It's got to all make sense. You will never run out of questions if you approach the things of God that way. There are going to have to be things where you're just going to have to say, God, you know, if you want me to know, you can reveal it to me, but I'm trusting in you. It's the person that I'm after. It's the person with whom I have a relationship, and I trust you. I don't have to know everything, just like a little child doesn't have to know how to get to grandma's house. Boy, we, we think we're, we're something, but so many barriers people put up with, uh, when it comes to the things of God. And then Paul talks about the things that the world values, your social status. Are you one of the high people in society or are you just one of these lowly people? How smart are you? How accomplished are you? And all of these, all these human values that, they, that people place so much stock in. So that's not, that's not what God goes by. Thank God. If he went by our social status, most of us would be uh, out. If he went by how smart we were, I think most of us would be out. If he went by all kinds of human accomplishment, we would, we would have no chance. But God doesn't go by that. Thank God. Why? He tells us, doesn't he? He says, so that no one can boast. Not one of us is going to be able to stand there on that day I am, and say, I am here because of something in me. God found something he valued in me, and, and that's why he chose me. Oh, no. If we stand there, we will stand there as, as objects of mercy and grace. God delights, as we've said many times, he delights in reaching down into the garbage can of humanity, as you will, if you will, and pulling somebody out and making them a child of the living God. Praise God. There's no place so deep that God cannot reach. And oh, how he loves to take, take nothing and make everything out of it. Thank God. That's the way I want to come. I just want to say, Lord, here I am. There's no virtue in me. There's no ability in me. There's no anything in me, Lord. It's not about me. But I just, I just surrender. I, I get it. I get where you're going with this, Lord. You, I was born into a race with no hope. We were prisoners in chains of sin, headed for death. No hope in ourselves. I don't care what we try to do. We can't fix it. But yet you have opened a door because you love us, because of your love and your mercy. You've opened a door where we can, we can be set free from all of that. Oh, thank God. Thank God for the message and the way he goes about things. All right? So that no one, verse down, verse 29 is where he says, so that no one can, may boast before him. It is because of him. Now get that. Not because of you. Not because of me. It's because of him. If you're in Christ, if you have a relationship, not just a knowledge of religious ideas, if you have a real living relationship with Christ and you have, you're born into his family, it's because of him. He's the one responsible for making that happen. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Everything that I need, he is. It's not just a thing that he gives me. He is all of those things. My righteousness is, is him 
He was made sin. He who knew no sin was made what? Sin. Why was he that? Why did, why did God make him sin? For us. He was made sin for us who knew no sin. Why? So that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, we need to realize who we are and, what, and how that's come about and just, just rejoice in him and praise him, bow before him. Honor that name, it's above every name. Praise God. All right, and holiness, that ability to be different from the world, it's not some sort of self-righteous act we put on. There's a real change God wants to make down in the heart that sets us free and sets us on a different course. Oh, we have a God who doesn't just look on the outside like people do. He sees all the way down in the heart, and this is what he needs to fix. Praise God, and he's the only one who's able to do it. All right? Okay, where was I? Hold, righteousness, holiness, and redemption, the ability to set me free from sin and to pay the price. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Okay? Now, Paul says something here that we can pass right over, and so it was with me. So what was? Paul is not saying, okay, so I'm, I'm somebody way up here, and I'm here to tell you all about it. He says, I'm one of you. God didn't call me because of earthly qualifications. He called me when I was his enemy. I was running around persecuting Christians. I helped kill Christians because they were followers of Jesus, and, God, and Jesus reached out to me one day. Praise God. He didn't go by all of that. He went right past all of that. He didn't pick me because I had any qualification for this. You know, it's, it's awfully good when we can stand here and say, look, I'm not up here trying to tell you, look down on you and tell you what. What's what? I'm one of you. God just happens to have me in this place, but it's not because I'm anybody. I have the same need before God that you do, but I got the same Savior too, and I want you to know about him. So anyway, and so it was with me, brothers and sisters. So now he talks about when he came with the message. What was it like? When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. Now, in Paul's case, it sounds like from things he writes later that Paul wasn't a particularly good speaker. Now, we, can, we sort of imagine, oh, Apostle Paul, he must be, you know, no, he was very unimpressive, apparently, in person. He, I don't know whether he stumbled over his words or just was not a good, particularly good speaker, but that's not the point. God didn't send him because of any natural qualification to really be able to speak and impress people with any of that. That's not what, it, what it's about. I didn't come that way as I proclaim to you the testimony of God about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. That's hard to picture, isn't it? How Paul really felt and what he was trying to, what he had to overcome in order to even talk to the people. Think about it. You ever feel that way? You're not alone. Paul was a pretty good example of that. God used him anyway, didn't he? Weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom but on God's power. You suppose maybe we just we need something that rests on God's power and not just on the ideas involved? That's what I, kind of what I'm sensing this morning, that God wants to put an emphasis where it needs to be placed. In the first place, Paul's message was not just about Jesus. Now, he did tell them about Jesus and what Jesus had done, but the message was not just, hey, I want to tell you about something, somebody and the ideas he came with and the things he did and we need to follow him. This was presenting a living Christ. Christ just didn't go off to heaven and sit there waiting. He is here. 
And, we, and he said, wherever two or three are gathered, that was referred to this morning, whether two or three are gathered in my name, where? What? There am I in the midst. Folks, if we ever get to a place where we are simply practicing our Bible tabernacle religion, we could preach things that are true from every natural standpoint. But if that's all we have, we have nothing. We need the living Christ to be to hear, to be in our midst and to make a difference. We have no message to preach, but here is a living Savior who's here to help you and to, to invade your heart, if you're willing, to make a difference in your life. Paul was talking at one place in Philippians, I believe, chapter 3, about the thing that drove him every day. What, what was his life about? He said, I want to know him. He didn't say, I want to know about him. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Being, con you know, being conformed to his death. I missed one of them. But anyway, that's, it, was, it wasn't just knowing, uh, getting a better handle on his religion, learning better theology and how to explain it better and how to answer all the what ifs and all that kind of stuff. My God, we need something more than that, don't we? We need the life and the power. We need, we need the reality. We need the living presence of Christ in our midst. And if we have him, we've got everything we need. Praise God. But I sense that he wants to come in and, and, and move in greater ways than perhaps we've ever known in the past. Don't you? I mean, I know we're, we're in the process. Those who know him, we're in the process of being saved. That means there's ground to take. That means there are things that we haven't really laid hold of yet. Paul, that's what Paul said, wasn't it? I, I, haven't, I haven't arrived. I'm still reaching. I'm reaching for things that they're mine, but I haven't got them yet. But they're there, and he's, he's there to help me. So Paul was emphasizing the center. It was the person of Christ. And I'll tell you, everything, that, that there's a lot of truths that you have to deal with at one point or another when it comes to uh, the, the gospel and living it out in this world. You know, marriage and family and kids and relationships in the church and what we do and how we, how we conduct ourselves before the world, sins that we learn to overcome. I mean, it's a long list of issues. How many of you know what a wagon wheel is? You may not have seen one, but, you know, you've seen them on TV anyway. But you know they've got a center that goes on the, this thing, whatever it is. Anyway, yes, thank you. Now, the spokes come out, though, from the center, don't they? you got the wheel out here, and then you got a center. And every spoke that reaches out to this goes back to the center. Folks, every single truth that there is has to go back to the person of Jesus Christ, who he is and who he is meant to be to us. That's the heart of the message. It's got to be Christ and him crucified or it's nothing. We need the living Christ to dwell in, in, in the midst of his people and to change them. Now, one of the things that I guess the central thought that, that drew me to this passage had to do with what Paul said. Let's see. I didn't underline this. I needed to. But with, it didn't come with just wise and persuasive words, more than just ex being able to explain it well but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. What in the world is that about? You know, Jesus said to the woman at the well, he's, he talked about how we worship God. He said we have to worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. You know, we made the point many times, you've got people who go, kind of go in one ditch or the other, with some, it's all about the Spirit. It's all about experience. It's all about power. We've got to see miracles or something's wrong. We've got to feel it. You come into a service, it's all about getting worked up in your emotions and getting excited and feeling something. And, oh, we've got to see a miracle. If we don't, something's wrong. He's not here. You know, God brings us to places where we don't feel him. And he's still there because he said, I'd never leave you, never forsake you. We can't go by that. But then you've got other people say, oh, no, all of that passed away. Don't have to worry about that anymore. We've got the Bible now. It's all about truth. Let's really nail down every little theological point and make sure you get it. Because this is where it's at. We've got to have truth. 
Folks, we need both. We don't need some of what they call all of that, that theology and all that stuff. You can go into ditches when you go, like, when you go too far that way. But we need the truth about what, who Jesus was, is, what he did, how that makes a difference in our lives. But what good is the information if we don't have the reality? If there's no actual change in our lives, I need him. You know, imagine a prisoner who's not only in the inner prison, like they described in the scriptures in one place, they got chains. They got bars and chains and guards. And Now, what good would it do for someone to come in and just accurately describe the situation? Tell them all about the chains and the bars and how they were made and what they're made of and the security of the system and the guards and explain the whole situation and say, God wants you to be free. And then leaves it there. What good would that do? I need somebody who can come into my life and invade my heart and, and set me free. Because if all he does is inform me of my problem and explain it to me, he might explain it just perfectly. What good does that do me if I don't get the help that I need? I need truth and I need the Spirit. I need God's power. I pray that God will, will make this real because you think about salvation. We've talked about this so many times. Salvation to a lot of people is just simply getting God to erase my sins because Jesus paid for them. And then because my sins are gone, I get to go to heaven. Well, that's part of the truth. Thank God for that truth. He did bear in his body my sins. That's what he, that's what he was carrying when he went to that tree and yours. Praise God. Every lie you've ever told, every evil thought you've ever had. If you were ever to be brought before the judgment and measured by the Ten Commandments, would you be innocent or guilty? Every single one of us would be guilty. I don't care. And reforming, what, what does reforming have to do with it? I mean, you could try to be a different person outwardly. That doesn't change what's in here. You know, a lot of people haven't committed adultery, literally. But Jesus said, when you look at a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery. See, God sees the inside. My God, we, we have a need. I thank God that he can erase my sins as if they had never happened and, and declare me righteous in God's eyes. That's, that's, the, that's the heart of the gospel. But that's not, the, that's not all of it. What good does it do away, do, to do away with the guilt of my sins but leave the sinner helpless to do any different? I've got to have a change. I've got to have something that gets down in here and begins to make a difference in my life. And I need power to do that. Praise God. Lord, just convey this because, you know, if I, I could just stand here and convey this as information, but if there isn't any life in it, what good would that do? You know, I, I sort of argue with the Lord, who am I to stand up here? What a ridiculous thing it would be to talk about the power of God and not have any power. Lord, that's up to you. I'm no great speaker. But for, I just sense God's heart reaching out and saying, I've got the power. You know, we, sang a, we used to sing a song with the ensemble, We've Got the Power. That's a great truth, isn't it? I don't think we realize what we have. But you know, somebody who's I mean, the, the heart of the gospel, first of all, is, to, is for, some, for a sinner to understand why Jesus went to the cross, to understand their guilt. It's not just that God wants to reform your outward behavior and make you religious and believe in a, a religious leader. You're a sinner. Without him, you have no hope unless God does something. And until we're brought to that place of need, the gospel means nothing. It's not just join, the, join my church and feel better and, and go to heaven one day. Oh, my God, there's got to be a confrontation of God by his spirit. You remember how Jesus said in his words 
the words that I speak, how often we say this, the words that I speak are what? Spirit and life. You remember where it says in one place how they took note of Jesus when he was teaching that he taught as somebody who had authority and not just like the scribes. You know, we need to ask God to help us to always, whatever form of ministry it is, whether it's just one-on-one -on -one or from here, every form of ministry needs to have God's authority behind it. It needs to have life. It needs to not just be a person uttering words. It needs to be God's on the scene conveying his, not just his words and his ideas, but his spirit. Because if we don't have power actually going out and making a difference, what do we have? We have nothing. Let's close the doors and go home. If Christ is not in inhabiting his church, then we have nothing. But folks, the, the message of the gospel is, to, is first of all to let a sinner know they're a sinner. And then to lift up Jesus and show them, this is what God has done for you. He has literally put your sins, charged his own son with your sins, the guilt of it. And he's gone there as your, not just your substitute, but your representative. And the only way to come into that relationship with him is for you to be 100% in agreement with what he did. Yes, Lord, I'm guilty. I recognize that what you did for me was God doing it. And I'm willing to hand my life over to you. This life that I have, that I, that I was born into this world with, it's not mine anymore because that's what the message of the cross goes on to. Jesus didn't just stay on the cross, did he? He died there. Then what? Well, they took him down. And what did they do with him? They buried him. That was an utter, complete renunciation of Adam's life that Jesus did. He literally laid down this life because there's no way. Does anybody here, everybody here realize there is nothing that you got from Adam that has any place in the kingdom that God is preparing. Nothing. I don't, your intelligence, your, your abilities, your, your moral strength, whatever it is, there's nothing. I don't need to be fixed. I need to be replaced. When Jesus went into that grave, he took me with him. He took the human race with him. He went in as the representative of all this creation and all that's wrong with it. God poured out his wrath and his judgment on it. But he didn't stay there, did he? He went in there because the plan of God was not just to reform the human race. It was to start brand new. It was to raise him up with the power and the life of God and, to raise, and not just to raise him up, but to put him on a place of authority, a throne. I don't think that means he's literally sitting in a chair somewhere, but it represents his place of authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given, Jesus said. Go therefore, that's the reason you can go because it's not just a message of a new religion. I've got life that I can share. God has put me in a position where I have the the very life of God flowing out of me, and I can share it with every repentant heart. Everyone that recognizes you need a deliverer, you need a Savior. Oh, my God, if there's one person who hears this and gets it, he is calling. He doesn't want you to invite, invite him into, his, into your heart as a guest. He needs to be the owner. He needs to be the one that comes in and imparts his life, his will, his plan, turns us from going this way to going this way, to going God's way. That takes some, that takes some effort. That takes some divine power, doesn't it? That's where God's going with this. There's got to be some power. Now, I referred to that uh, to where Paul talked about the demonstration of, of the Spirit's power. And I felt like that needs a little bit of clarification. What do you think of when you think of the demonstration of the Spirit's power? Well, most people, I think, think of miracles. God's going to come and just heal bunches of sick people and raise people from the dead, cast out devils. There's all kinds of miraculous things that are going to happen, and God's going to 
give us a sign and prove his power. Well, God can do that. That hasn't gone away. That's not the heart. When Jesus was walking the, the earth, what, I mean, what was the purpose of all of the miracles? Was it just because God's main concern was, him, was making sick people well? It was a testimony to the message. It was a testimony to who he was and why he had come. It was a sign. How many of you, if you're going to some place, you're going to a city someplace, and you, re you reach a point on the highway where there's a sign that says such and such a city so many miles, how many of you stop and worship the sign? Or do you, you treat the sign as you like it's your destination? Oh, this is what I've been, this is what I've been looking for. It's a sign. Oh, wonderful. No. If God does something like this, and he can, it's meant to point to the Savior. It's not to point to the sign and to be gloried in. The reality is God can come in a circumstance, in a service, in a proclamation of the gospel, and there's nothing of the miraculous in that sense. And he's just as real. What is it that God wants to do? What, is, what does he really want to do when it comes to demonstrating his power? Where do I need his power? I need it in here. Like I say, what good would it be for someone to go to that prisoner who's locked away and demonstrate, look at the power that I've got, look at the power, and he's still sitting there. Or to explain it, I need something that gets down into my heart. I need to realize that God wants to invade my space. He has given his son all the life, all of the power that I need to become the person he wants me to be. That's where he wants to demonstrate. Do you think just maybe that God wants to demonstrate more things in our lives than we've experienced? Do you think maybe we've somehow gotten complacent in areas of our lives and just sort of, well, that's the way it is. I'm just kind of the person that I am. That's all there is to it. You know, even when we come to that place where we open our hearts and he comes in and there's a, there's a sense, I'm his child. He loves me. I love him. I've been forgiven. My, my destiny is, is in his hands. Praise God. That's an awesome start. Doesn't even have to be a great experience in the sense that we, icicles are running up and down your spine. Sometimes it can be very quiet. But that, that beginning point is, is just a beginning. And I'll tell you, I believe with all my heart that the demonstration of God's power that Paul was most concerned about was not just, hey, I performed a miracle. You better believe this, this, this person. It's he has come to change your heart and your life to set you free from shackles that have bound you because you were born into Adam's family. There is a power in sin, folks. Something we've talked about many times. Sin is a real power. It holds us captive apart from Christ. It's like the slave master that Paul describes in one place in Romans. It tells us to jump and we say, all we say is how high. I need help. I need deliverance. I need, I need, some, I need power. But what good is it if we preach all about Jesus and it doesn't really make a change in our lives? I believe with all my heart we need to pray. We need to seek God and say, Oh, God, I thank you for truth. I thank you for your presence. But I want to see more lives transformed. I want to see real victories. I want to see real, I want to see a demonstration that he is who he says he is. That it's not just that he can forgive my sins, but he can come and make me a brand new person and change me into the image of, into the image of Christ. You know, I appreciate you know, Brother Eric, who visited with us a few weeks ago, I appreciate the testimony that he gave, but not just the testimony, but the way he presented it. Because he talked about our 
testifying to somebody else, what do we tell them? Is it a matter of memorizing a lot of theology and getting a, a, a soul winning script down pat so we can spit it out like a salesman? No, he said, just tell what he's done for you. So what's he done for you? Ah, now we get right back to the real issue, don't we? Paul wanted them to understand the things of God, to know why Jesus died, why was he buried, why was he raised from the dead, what's the significance of him sitting on a throne and calling people to himself. What's the significance of that? We can understand those things. God wants us to have an understanding. But what good is any of that if it is not translated into practical difference in our lives to where we're walking free from those things from which he's saving us? Kind of a complicated way to say it, but you get the point, don't you? Anybody here need, need more of the power of God in your life? Yeah. I mean, we'd love to see miracles and see the Lord anoint somebody to perform miracles, and I'm, I don't rule any of that out. There's a place and a time for God to do something that's special. But that is never the center. Paul didn't come saying, I, I came among you to demonstrate my miraculous power and how God's anointed me. And, oh, isn't it wonderful? Jesus. Everything, everything goes right back to the person. I want you to know him. I want you to have a personal relationship with him. What good is it if you know about him but you don't know him? If he has never invaded your space and brought his life-saving power into your heart, what good is it? Praise God. You see where Paul is going with this? What kind of demonstration is Paul looking for? Was he just looking for the fact that God sometimes used him in miracles? No, he wanted to see the change in people's hearts and lives. And where does that come from? It comes from Jesus. We've got to get back to him. And the point here is that we go through life rightfully being made aware by God of needs. The question is, what do we do when God shows us our need? Well, we know how the devil, what the devil does. He jumps on it and gives us every excuse in the book to say, again, like, that's just how, the kind of person I am, or, you know, it's not about that, or it's, it's because of them, or the thousand and one things that, somehow make it seem like that's just, nothing's going to change. God wants us to be reaching out to him as we never have before in our lives and saying, oh God, change me, change me. Lord, just convey whatever you want to do this morning. And I certainly feel, I'm no Paul by any stretch, but I certainly feel my own weakness and my own need. The Lord's reminded me this week, in many ways, about needs that I have. Areas where, if I'm honest, the old nature still has a lot of hold. I mean, I can talk about all that Jesus did and I died with him and I rose with him and what difference has that made in this area or that area? Am I just kind of coasting and figuring, okay, well, I've got the ticket to heaven in my pocket, I, I'm good. Or does the Lord want to, take, want to demonstrate his power? What testimony do I have for somebody else who has the same need that I have? If, I, if God hasn't done something about it in me and given me a real measure of victory over it, do you believe that God has given us through Jesus and him living in us and being right there the power to say no to temptation? Do we have that power? I wonder how many times we forget that or we just go right along listening to the old slave master when he says jump and we jump. But God is, longs to bring a deliverance in a greater way to every one of his children. Oh, how he loves us. Praise God. I thought of several scriptures that sort of confirm what I was saying. First, uh, First Thessalonians 1, I think, is a pretty good confirmation that Paul was just not talking about miracle power. I meant Timothy, not Thessalonians. 
anyway, I'll get there. First Thessalonians, he's talking, writing to the believers there. And he says, verse 2, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus. So where did that come from? Good information? Or do you suppose there's something supernatural about this? For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Now, how did He know that? Because our gospel, our message, our good news came to you not simply with words. Let that sink in. You can explain it perfectly. But if that's all there is, there's, it's not, there's no good. It came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. I pray that if God, if there, again, if there's somebody who doesn't know the Lord, that, that God will just come upon you with such conviction you will not be able to stand it. You would come running to the Lord and hand Him your life and invite Him to come in and take over and save you because you need Him. But even if you come to that point, we can get to a place of complacency where we're just putting up with things. The old nature still kind of in charge, if we're honest, in a lot of areas. We still have thoughts and imaginations that don't go to good places. And we don't always just shut them down and say no right away. We're prone to be anxious and angry under the right circumstances. We're prone, if we get behind a turtle in, in the traffic, to be just a little bit impatient and angry about it. <laughs> I suspect that I'm not the only one, and Joel's not the only one. You know, we, we laugh about it, but fear, anxiety, resentment, all of these things that we know where they come from. Do you think any of those things are going to be there? No. But the Lord wants to give us a victory here in a deeper sense. And I believe with all my heart, He wants us to come to Him and recognize, Lord, You don't just have the, You don't just tell me what's wrong and tell me what to do, but You also give me the power to do it. And I need you right now, Lord, to come and fulfill your promise to me that you're here not just to work with me to will, but also to do of your good pleasure. I realize I got my part to cooperate with you, but I can't do it unless you supply the energy. You know, there was a reason that David was able to face Goliath and the rest of the army wasn't. But it wasn't just words, was it? David understood the battle is the Lord's. He understood that the battle was against the Lord and the, this was the enemy and, and he, was, he was the one in the strong place. But he didn't just sit there and, and, and run in the energy of those words and ideas, did he? He actually expected God to go and fight with him. What a concept. I wonder... How many times? Maybe that's what we need. We, we're sort of praying, oh God, somehow magically make this go away. Do you know the, the flesh is not going to stop wanting what it wants until we lay it down and it's gone? So what, what, what's, what's that about? How does that work? We need the Lord. We need to be able to go to the Lord when, we, when there's a particular need when we're in a particular place in our journey and say, oh God, you show me my need, but I've got a Savior. And I'm not alone in this battle. The battle is yours. This is not a battle about everything out there. Yes, I've got enemies out there that are trying to work, but they got the reason they've got an influence on me is because of what's in here. 
I've still got the, 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 old, the old man is still trying to have his way. And the question is, who's going to win this little battle? Well, Lord, if all you're doing is telling me what to do, I've, I've already lost. But I need you to come, and I'm going to say no, but I am doing it believing in your promise. I recognize what Jesus did for me, that he didn't stay in that grave. He came out with a brand new life, and he, shared, he has shared that life with me. I'm not down here in a weak place. He has lifted me up and seated me in heavenly places with Christ. I mean, that's what it says. I get the feeling, the same feeling I sometimes have. Yeah, okay, what does that mean? That's nice words. Those are nice words. Folks, God wants to make that real. Do you believe that? Do you believe God wants to make those truths real in our lives and in our hearts? I do. I can think of areas in my own life that I, I really need. I don't just need better wisdom and better power. I need Jesus. And I, I said, I don't need better power. I, I don't need better, like I say, information and, and willpower. Is what I guess what I was trying to get at. I need Jesus to come in and say, Lord, help me. Didn't Paul say, I mean, how did Paul do what he did? I have been crucified with Christ. Paul recognized the truth of what Jesus did. He went to the cross. He took me with him into that grave. I've been crucified with him. But it didn't end there. Nevertheless, what? I live. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I'm trying to, I'm getting some of the, I'm leaving some of it out. I live by faith of the, in the, of the Son of God, but it's, Christ, it's not I but Christ who lives in me. It is no longer I but Christ who lives in me. That's the point of the Christian life, is when we deal with the issues that arise and we recognize Christ is here, but Lord, I need you to step up here and give me the power. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my part. I'm going to say no. But I need you to, I need the power source to go behind that. It's not enough for me just to say no, I need power. Like David ran for the giant, but when he threw it, like the song says, he threw the rock and God did the rest because David knew that he wasn't alone. Are you alone or do you just feel that way? A lot of times we, we tackle things in our lives or we just sort of shove them to the side. We pretend they aren't there. When God wants us to look every issue in the eye and say, Christ is in me. I have the power through him to be the person that he wants me to be. Boy, I'm, I'm saying this is one who needs this as much as anybody in this place. But is this the truth? Is this just information? Is this just theology? Or is God trying to say something to every one of us? I have the power. Think of what Paul said it was in Ephesians chapter 3. Scripture we use so many times because it follows the, the message about God's amazing love, His his unfolding of his eternal purpose and then the love that he has and all that we have, all that we possess, there are incredible riches. And then he comes down here in verse 20 and says, Now, to him who is able, see, this is God's ability, not mine. <laughs> That's pretty important, isn't it? To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, more than I can even conceive. What? Based on what? According to his power that is at work where? Oh, wait a minute, it's within us. You see where Paul, God's not talking so much about power that's out here just to say, yeah, I'm a God of power. This is where I need it. He can do all that stuff out there, but if he doesn't change this in here, that's not really salvation, is it? He could heal my body, but I'm still going to lose it. Thank God. <laughs> Be glad for the new one. According to his power that is at work within us. Now we come back to the center. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
Praise God. You see the foundation Paul was building on. I don't want just a, a Christ that you learn about that did all this wonderful stuff in history, and then he's way back there somewhere. I guess for you it would be that, this way, wouldn't it? But he's not, it's not just the information you need. You need a relationship with him. You need to walk with him. You need to listen for him every single day. I thought of other scriptures that we've referred to that would just kind of confirm a lot of this. What is it? Second Peter, we, we've used it a lot. Where Peter writes, grace and peace be yours in abundance. What is grace again? It's God's power at work saving undeserving sinners. This is God's power at work. This is not just some sort of kindly attitude. This is God actually invading my life because I need him. I need divine power. Okay? Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Anybody here needs some abundance? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then he says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them, you know, what? all right, the promises, well, that's great. What does that have to do with? So that through them, you may participate in the divine nature. How can somebody like me become like him? That's nuts. I can't do that. But that's why God invades and says, I know you can't, but I can. If you believe me and trust me and ask me and reach out to me, I will come and be all that you need. I have every bit of power that you could ever want but you're going to need to look to me and believe my promises. Oh, how often do we, we listen to the voice of the enemy. We listen to the voice of doubt. We're focused on the need and on the, the problem and, and the inability and all the, all the things we shouldn't be focused on. We need to know those things, but at the same time, we need to be able to turn and say, but, but God, but God, get your butts in the right place, but God. He's the one that has the answer for this particular need right now. And I'll tell you, God has a way. Many of, us, many of you can testify. You've been in a place of need, and God came, and the, came with his word. And he spoke something. But you didn't just leave it there. You believed it, and you acted accordingly. That's what God is looking for from many of us right now, because we're stuck you know, we had a message one time, I think, more than one, because it's a, it's a common need in all of us. We get stuck sometimes, and God wants to unstick us. All right. So that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil, evil desires. Praise God. I thought of one other scripture that in back in... Uh, See if I can find 1 Thessalonians again. Chapter 5. Paul gives the Thessalonian believers a lot of exhortations, you know, support the weak, pray continually. So many, so many things about, uh, you know, try the spirits, be open and all of that kind of stuff. But anyway, it says rejoice always, pray continually. Verse 16, give thanks in all circumstances. We're all good at that, aren't we? Give thanks in all circumstances. Everybody's just saying, shouting, and rejoicing, and saying amen. Give thanks in all circumstances. Wouldn't that be an expression of faith that God's bigger than all the stuff that we don't want to be thankful for? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat, treat prophecies with contempt. But... Test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God, this is, the, this is the key here. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Sanct what does sanctify mean? Set me apart from common use for God's use. Let's take a, a dirty dish 
that's worthless, that's all rusted and messed up, clean it up, make it completely fit to serve a king. God is going to change us completely so we are fit to live in his kingdom. Only God can do that. Of course, that's what this verse is about, isn't it? May he sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Great, how am I going to do that? But that's what Paul is saying. That's, what, that's where we're going with this. We want to be just completely ready to step into his kingdom when he comes. How in the world could such a thing be? And verse 24 gives us the answer. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Praise God. I believe with all my heart God wants to demonstrate his power in us. I believe he wants to give us a bigger testimony, a greater testimony to where we can come to somebody in need and say, I know where you're at. I'm made of the same stuff. I've been there. I've done that. But Jesus is the answer. It's not religion. It's not religious doctrine. It's the person of Jesus. He, came in, he not only came into my heart, but when I had to face that thing, he gave me the strength to say no. I had the voice of my flesh saying, this is what I want. And all my old nature was so used to just believing that and giving into it, but he was there, and I said, no, I don't have to do that. Jesus is here. I'm not alone in this battle. I don't need just better information about this situation. I need Jesus to give me power to do the right thing and to say no. Anybody here need him in some area of your life? <laughs> Well, he's faithful, isn't he? Isn't that what it says? He's faithful, and he will do it. How many times have we talked about the work that he's begun, he's going to continue until the day of Jesus Christ. See, do you get a little bit of a sense of what Paul was wanting when he's talking about a demonstration of the Spirit? I've encountered people who have taught that this means that when, the, when he's present and when the gospel is going out, there's going to be all kinds of strange things happening out here. People are going to be falling on the ground un under the power. Well, you remember way back, well, they're going to be laughing in the Spirit. They're going to be doing this. It's going to be real strange manifestations. That's God's power at present demonstrating this message. Is that what that's about? No. Paul's saying, I want a message that changes the heart, that has power to go all the way down to the depths of your soul and make you a different person. If you don't know the Lord, he's going to come in and give you peace and joy in him. But even then, it's not a matter about living in the, in the realm of feelings. That's the thing. You don't have to even feel all this. God can give you strength and power to do, what, do the right thing just by looking to him and believing him and trusting him and stepping out in that faith. I believe we need to ask him. We need to confess it. And we need to serve him. You remember how John was given the book, the Revelation, and how he talked about the victory that was won at the cross, and that now has come salvation and the power of our God, the kingdom of his Christ. Something, all those words are in there somewhere. And it talked about how they overcame him, how blood of the Lamb. Boy, you've got to go back to that. If he doesn't cleanse my sins, I have no standing. But he did. And I'm going to lean on that. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to him every time I need him. But then is the word of my testimony. This word, this truth has got to be something that I can speak with confidence because I know that he's behind it. He's going to back me up. It's not just me trying to, have a, trying to pr project a religious idea. I have Jesus living here empowering me to say this is the place that I have the right to stand because he earned it for me. He did it all. It's all from him. That's my foundation. I'm not standing on any ability or anything that I am. I'm standing on Jesus and him alone, period. End of story. And I'm going to confess that. But now you get into issues where parts of you want to live. Now, sometimes that keeps people out of the kingdom. 
It did the rich young ruler. And Jesus said, you know, one thing you lack, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come and take up your cross and follow me. Come and follow me. He didn't do that because he loved his money more. But even those who know the Lord, we're going to come up on areas where areas of our lives have had a strong hold. And we're going to have to be willing to let go. Now, how can I do that? Again, I better get strength from him because I don't have it. But he is so faithful if I'm willing to just come to him and seek him. Folks, we need to seek him in every area for our personal lives that God will give us more of the victory that he won at the cross. Is there anything that he did that he lacked that we need? Anything he failed to do, anything he's leaving up to us, he did it all. He paid it all. He gives us, unworthy sinners though we are, he gives us himself. May God help us to experience the power of his resurrection in a deeper way and be willing to let go of this life that can't endure anyway. You can't take this stuff into heaven. We're going to be able to, we need to be able to let it go and just put all our hope and trust in him. I'll tell you, there's a God who wants to make himself real, and it's not just you know, icicles running up and down your spine and spiritual experiences. God can do that. I've experienced that in my life, but that's not what it's about. We need to be able to believe him when we don't feel a thing. Do you believe he's just as real? I mean, we say we do, but when, when that really happens, has he gone off somewhere? Or is he right there looking, up, looking to us to, take, to believe him, to take him at his word and trust him right now for the strength that I need to handle this need and to grow in him? That was Paul's testimony. I haven't arrived, but I'm following after. I'm pressing on. And what I want to, I'm, I'm going to take hold of this. He, he took hold of me so that I could have a whole lot, a bunch, right? I could have eternal life. But in the process of, of walking out this salvation that he's given me, there are things that I need to lay hold of. He wants me to, to actually reach out and believe him and ask him. I wonder if there are areas where we've settled. You think maybe? Areas we've settled and God wants to say, I've got the power to deliver you in that area, to make you freer than you have ever been. You need to be crying out to me and believing me and taking steps and acting, acting out and not pretending. I don't mean pretending, Ron. I mean putting it into action. And God is going to back up his people just like he backed up David when he went to Goliath. We've got an awesome God. We've got an awesome Christ. We need the truth about him, but we need him right here, active in our lives, invading our space, and setting us free and making his ch children of God. Praise God. Isn't he awesome? Don't we have every reason to rejoice in him this morning and just give him the praise and lift him up? What other message do we have? I can't help you. My ideas, my abilities certainly can't help you. But I've got a Savior who has done everything necessary to take you and me from, all, from right where we're at all the way into the kingdom where we could stand in a place like Isaiah saw that was holy and pure and awesome and be right at home because of what he did. But right today, you and I have things in our lives. We need him, don't we? Let's reach out to him and ask him and believe him and know that he's faithful and he's going to move us along. Thank God.